uh, for me. Uh, so, I mean, I have to leave all that behind when I became a BBC journalist. Uh, however, um, thanks for putting the, um, putting the it's, uh, strangely enough, a lot of the book talks I've been doing have been at left or alternative bookshops like this, and not a lot of them at sort of Adam Smith Institute type places, although they have invited me to do them. Um, so, that aside, uh, let me try and just say what the book says. Uh, I do. I am on a tight schedule today because I am working, and I will. I'm, I don't know whether I'll be on news like yeah, It depends whether whether it gets worse than it's already had, has done. Um, for Labour, I've turned my mobile off, but it's full of messages about what's going on. Please sit down. Well, let's try not to get distracted by that meltdown. Let's stay with this one that's happened. The purpose of the book was to try and explain what happened. We're in the middle of an economic recession, downturn. Parts of the world are in, in slump, parts of the world are facing deflation, but the book concentrates on an event that is by now largely over, and that is the financial meltdown of September through to April, May, that we've just lived through. And that's because if you write in a book, there's a long lead time. You can't write a book about something that is, that, where there are many variables. I tried to, I thought, well, you can write something that just gives the first draft of what happened. If you go back and read Galbraith's book about 1929, of which this, of course, is a poor imitation, it, that's what it does. It just tells you day by day, and it tries to say, well, what were the important things? And, in, <clears throat> you know, we will, we will not really know what they were until many of the memoirs come out, some of the secrets are unleashed, and until we get the perspective of history about how bad the crisis has been. And I pr probably a lot of you will want to talk about now and the crisis, Good, let's do that. Let me just do the, the intro about, about the financial meltdown and what caused it. If you look at a graph of US GDP in the whole post-war period, it looks like um, the, 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 the temperature chart of a patient uh, who's got fever. It veers from growth, quite rapid growth, to recession. Eight times. There are eight recessions between 1952 and 1990. Those of you who are old enough to remember will know we used to call this the stop-go economy. America had it, Britain had it. Suddenly, in the 1990s, the patient gets better. The graph becomes mild. The fluctuations are shallow. And instead of eight recessions in 40 years, over the next 20 years you get only two. And they're hardly recessions at all. You get the recession of uh, the early 90s, and you get the recession which followed the collapse of dot-com, but even that was hardly a recession at all. Now, the argument of... <coughs> oh, let me just add another thing. Something else gets better. In the post-war period, in the, in, in the 70s, you'll remember, the late 60s, 70s, all the way through to the early 80s, you got rocketing inflation, driven by oil prices. But again, in the 90s, and since the 90s, inflation gets better. It smooths out. The patient calms down. Now, the, uh, Ben Bernanke, the, uh, the American central banker, calls this the great moderation. We have lived through it. And his argument is, what caused it? Was, well, he asked himself three things. Was it good luck, the collapse of the Soviet Union, counts as good luck in, uh, in, in the American Federal Reserve? Was it structural change, i.e. globalization, capitalism? Or was it policy enacted by people like Ben Bernanke? And you'll be not surprised to know that Ben Bernanke's answer was three, B or C, policy. It was, it was, it was the, the, the voluntaristic action of policymakers that put capitalism right once and for all. And for the last 20 years, it calms down. Inflation calms down, growth fluctuations moderate. Now, my argument in this book is that that is rubbish. And that it was not put right once and for all, and in fact it has gone seriously wrong. And that far from it being the magic of better policy and sort of better spreadsheets and computers, it, there was something structural that happened within capitalism and that these, this period of moderation and uh, the relatively benign growth was not an illusion but that it is over. That the, 
what I call the neoliberal era, the era of free market economics, globalization, and relatively crisis-free growth, is over because what underpinned it has run out and it's proved temporary. You see, Bernanke says, in the United States, a deep and liquid financial system has promoted growth by effectively allocating capital and it's increased economic resilience by increasing our ability to share and diversify risks both domestically and globally. And what he's de describing there is the dominance of the finance system through which you can mobilize deep and liquid, as he says, financial reserves, allocate them effectively and logically. And instead of things becoming more risky, they become less risky because that financial system is more complex and more effective. Now he said this approximately five weeks before the financial system collapsed. <laughs> and I think that there is no, there is, those of you, and there will be lefties here and Marxists and anarchists who, are, who, who share a, a, a critique of Ben Bernanke and his politics, um, you know, you don't really have to rely on your inner principles anymore because empiricism, fact, is enough. <laughs> the system has collapsed. It didn't. It wasn't deep and liquid. It proved to, the liquid dried up overnight. Instead of effectively alloc allocating capital, we find that about $10 trillion worth of capital has been misallocated. But $2 trillion of it can never be paid back, possibly going on to now the IMF believes $4 trillion that will be destroyed because it was misallocated by this system. And instead of sharing and diversifying risks, as Ben says in this quote, it did not. It it heightened and focused them to the point where the, they nearly, as he then memorably had to say, three days after the collapse of Lehman Brothers, it nearly caused a global cardiac arrest of capitalism, the like of which we never even saw after 1929. The ATMs were within hours of stopping issuing money <laughs> in the American system. That's why they panicked. Now, I argue, far from policy, what it was that cured, temporarily, capitalism of this fluctuation of the stop-go, of the repeated recessions, of the terrible problems with inflation, was debt. If you look at a graph of debt in the USA as a proportion of its GDP, then for most of the post-war era, during the post-war boom, right through to the end of the 1980s, it's between 100, 120% of GDP. So that's companies' debts and people's debts. And then, at the beginning of the Thatcher-Reagan era, it takes off. And then it takes off again at the beginning of the Clinton era and dot-com. And now, on the eve of the crisis, anyway, it was 350% of GDP. So debt had pumped in to the American economy and to the world economy, creating what I call, the, you know, synonymous with the neoliberal era, the debt era. And that it, above all, in the last decade we've lived through, the debt decade. Let's, let's have, a, let's have a, a think about what the result of that have been. It's a shame I haven't got my PowerPoint, because it, there, there's one or two things, you, I might just lift this up and show you. Which is, just, let, me, let me do that, because I, I know some of you are miles away, but you, 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 I might just wander. Because this is, this is good. Okay, an asset bubble, an asset bubble is defined as where the price of something, a, a, a tradable commodity that is an investment, the price rockets, and it, it trades in very much higher volumes than it should, and its intrinsic price just goes out of kilter with what the actual price on the market is. We have lived through, in the last decade, fueled by this debt, this cheap money, We'll talk in a minute about where it comes from, but the fact that it's there is incontrovertible. 350% of American GDP, comparable amounts across the Western world. This has fueled bubble after bubble. The, what I do in these graphs are just show shapes. Forget, forget figures. Sh shapes. Okay, that's the dot-com bubble. 